Yeah. Always look at a wounding as an invitation. Mm-hmm. Instead of seeing it as, oh my God, there's a thing, I got to fix it. I got to find all the ways that I can like, you know, run away from it is what we're essentially saying. The opportunity is, can we look at this wounding as an invitation to deepen into ourselves? <laughs> This is your Kick-Ass Life Podcast, episode number 263 with guest Thais Sky. This is the Your Kick-Ass Life Podcast with Andrea Owen, a no BS guide to self-help and badassery. Because ladies, let's face it, life's too short for it to not kick ass. And here's your host, the girl who serves it up straight with a side of crazy, Andrea Owen. Hey there, Ask Kickers. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I am so glad that you are here. It is our first interview of 2019. Last week, if you didn't listen, I thought it was a pretty good episode talking about New Year, New You. I actually wanted to add something to that now that I'm thinking about it. I wanted to talk about 2018 in terms of, well, okay, let me back up. Last week, if you didn't listen to it, I was talking about the new year, new you, blah, blah, that goes around in the personal development spheres about, you know, setting 2019 up right for you and you need to do this and you need to do that to live your best life. And while that can be super helpful for some people, some people look to January every year as a reset button, as a time to really kind of get their shit together. And it feels motivating and inspiring. And that's great if that's you. For a lot of people, it's not. It feels overwhelming. Some people live in the land of snow in January where it feels like, ah, uh, all I want to do is rest and eat pizza and I will get my shit together in the spring. That's how I feel. But I also want to say this that I forgot to mention last week is that I think it's always a good idea to reflect on the year. So what was great about 2018? What is some growth that you had? I know if you're an avid listener to this podcast, you probably listen to other podcasts as well. You probably read self-help books and do workshops and all of those great things. So what are some lessons that you have learned that have made you a better person? Is there something maybe that you can revisit? I know somebody birthed a book in 2018. That'd be me. And I know a lot of you participated in my book club last year. There is a workbook attached to the book and it's actually questions. It's the same questions that are at the end of each chapter of my book. Was there something that really resonated with you that you worked on that might be a good idea to go back? I know I always love going back to my self-help books and looking at the things that I highlighted. (laughs) It just is, it can be refreshers for you. I just want to put an emphasis on What was great about 2018 for you? What did you learn? What did you accomplish? I think for so many women that come into the YKAL community are very much quick to jump over their accomplishments and or feel awkward and uncomfortable talking about and really bragging about things that they've done. You know, things they've kicked ass at, things that have gone really great for them. And I encourage you to do that. What did you get done in 2018 that you're proud of? What do you want to carry over with you in 2019? What are some things that you worked on that you want to continue working on? So all that to say, do a 2018 in review. It doesn't have to be fancy. You don't have to buy a special year in review journal for it. Just get out a good old fashioned pen and paper or pull up a document on your computer and get to work. (laughs) So as I was saying, super pumped about today's podcast episode. And there's one thing that I want to mention. So at the very end of this podcast, Thais mentions a podcast that she likes to listen to called Seen on Radio. So after she and I recorded that, I went and listened to it. And oh my God, y'all have to go and listen to this podcast. It's S-C-E-N-E, 
seen on radio and they're actually out of Duke University here in North Carolina and it's a docu series there's 3 seasons i have not listened to season 1 yet that is next but season 3 is all about men and male supremacy and patriarchy and like and it's from a scientific standpoint too which i love 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 how did we get to where we are historically i think it's episode 7 on that particular season called empathy blue my mother loving mind i was like taking screenshots of it and sending it to all of my friends. I'm like, you have got to listen to this podcast and you especially have to listen to this particular episode. You don't even have to go in order. You can bounce around, um, but it probably will make a little bit more sense if you go in order. And then the season two is on whiteness. And so it's just actually, I think that the title of it is called Seeing White. Super interesting, so informative, and I highly, highly encourage you to go listen to it. And also, it's just a great conversation that that Thais and I have. One quick last thing. I finally have the page up, the info page, the invitation page, if you will, for the mentorship that is starting this spring. So it's at yourkickasslife.com slash mentorship. I've had many calls so far, and some people are already signing up. I do put a cap on this program because I keep it small and intimate so you can get the support that you need. It's very hands-on. I do not actually touch you, but <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> What's included in this program that I'm really pumped about is a workshop retreat here at my house in May. And that I will touch you if you want to hug. <laughs> I guess it is hands-on in the sense of, yes, you will get a hug if you choose to come to the workshop and retreat. It is a bonus. And it's all about shame resilience skills. It's, you know, if I had to bottom line exactly what I teach women to do and help nav- help them navigate through, it's better coping skills. We get to a point in our lives where we're like, these coping skills aren't working anymore. The numbing, the isolating and hiding out, the overachieving and control and people pleasing, the things that we know, right? The things that you write about in my second book. And again, you know, we fall back on those from time to time. And by we, I mean we, because me too. And I teach shame resilience. So I know it's kind of confusing for some because people say, well, I don't really walk around feeling ashamed per se. Like I've had some moments in my life and situations where of course they felt, you know, shaming, but I don't walk around feeling ashamed. Well, we don't, but anytime we are participating in those behaviors, the perfectionism, the the numbing out, the isolating and hiding out, the avoiding, we are doing so in an effort to avoid shame. We're doing so in an effort to try to protect us. And it ends up feeling like shit. And, you know, hence the title of my second book. And that's what this program teaches you is concrete science-based tools and methodologies so that you can be proud of the person that you are, so that you can conduct yourself from a place of compassion and confidence and courage and do the next right thing. And a lot of it is getting the support that you need from other women. There's so much. There's so much. I am going to not go on and on. Head over to yourkickasslife.com slash mentorship, and you can read all about it there. All right. So before we jump in, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. Thais is a truth speaker, healer, women's coach, and feminist on a heart-led mission to support the seekers, the edge dwellers, and the why the heck do I feel so broken of the world reclaim their sense of belonging by learning how to explore, trust, and express themselves unapologetically. Based on her own healing journey and decades of research and mentoring women worldwide, she has developed a comprehensive model that explores and offers tools and skills to heal the pervasive sense of unworthiness within women, which she calls the worthiness wound. So without further ado, here is Thais. Thais, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. You and I met, well, it's been a long time. It's been almost a year when I was kind of touring the United States on my book tour. And I'm, I am so lucky to have gotten the chance to hug you in the flesh. And I I'm excited about this conversation because our work is so complimentary. And let me just jump in because the first thing someone sees when they land on your website are the words, reclaiming your worth is a radical 
act. So can you tell Mm -hmm. us what does reclaiming look like? What does that mean? Yeah, I love the word reclaim. You know, I think when we're talking about claiming something, we're talking about taking out something on that's new. Um, But I believe that our worth is not new. Um, The concept of worthiness is not it's not a new concept that we have to create within ourselves. It's something that we are already inherent, um, but we've kind of forgotten along the way for a multitude of reasons. We've forgotten because of our culture. We've forgotten because of our um, upbringing. We've forgotten because um, it benefits the larger reality if we feel unworthy, right? So for me, I've, I'm obsessed with this idea of how can we reclaim our sense of worthiness and unhook ourselves from the tantalizing capitalistic narrative that tells us that our worth is tied to our productivity. Mm-hmm. Our worth is tied to how our body looks. Our worth is tied to um, how we appear to the world, you know? It's, I, you know, like the first thing that came to me when I was listening to you say that, like, that is like a big, green, hairy, scary monster. But I don't, <laughs> and I mean, just <laughs> what I mean by that is because it's so, it can be multi layered and multifaceted. And like you said, because it can come from our family of origin, from our culture, from past relationships, and untangling and unlearning that is, is work. And I, I love that you use the word reclaim. Yeah. Well, yeah. follow up to that last question. This is maybe what you were jumping into. So what are a few, yeah, yeah. like even just like one small step that someone can take towards reclaiming their worth or maybe like, where do you start with clients when you first start working with them? That's a big question. I know. Uh, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> depends. It does depend. But here's the thing. So uh, the reason why I've even started doing my work with the concept of worthiness is because I think it's very understood from a cultural perspective that having a sense of worth is key to the things that we want in our lives, whether that's happiness or freedom or fulfilling relationships. We have this sense that worthiness is the answer. Like we have this sense that if we feel worthy enough of blank, there's going to be less obstacles to that blank. Um, But the problem is whenever I read any self-development book, I've poured through hundreds of them, you know, everyone talks about the, the importance of worth, but no one really talks about how to cultivate that sense of worth. And it's different. Cultivating worthiness is different than cultivating confidence. Mm -hmm. Confidence is a space of like, the more you do something, the more confident you feel about that thing. Whereas worthiness, I, you know, I, I coach women from you know, entrepreneurs to women in the corporate world. And there are women who have been doing this for 10, 20 years that they've been on their career path, or they've been, you know, practicing this hobby for so long, and they still don't feel worthy enough of the success that they want or the happiness that they want, et cetera, et cetera. Cause it's not just about building, um, a specific skill set like confidence. So I just wanted to put that as like the yeah. foundation. The reason why I think worthiness is such an important conversation is because the more that we can feel worthy, the less we believe the narrative that's keeping us oppressed, that's keeping us feeling like we don't belong on this planet. Mm-hmm. And so worthiness and belonging go hand in hand for me. Um, and so how, what, what do we do? Well, I think the first really critical and important step to recognizing and reclaiming our worth is getting really real with ourselves on where we feel unworthy. Because I think oftentimes we have a lot of shame around our worthiness wound. We don't want to admit that we feel unworthy of X, Y, Z. We blame it on other things. We um, say, oh, it's because I I don't want a relationship or, oh, I don't need, you know, um, that opportunity anyway. And we shut down the conversation because it's scary and yeah. sometimes embarrassing to admit that we have a space within us that feels like we can't take up space, that we can't go after what we want. And so while I recognize that the shame is there, um, I invite all of us to go a layer deeper and to be really, really real with ourselves on where we feel like we're not worthy. Because only when we can really be unapologetic about seeing where we are not, can we actually do something different. Mm-hmm. Yes, that is that is an um, 
perfect first step and it really depends. And I think that I think I'm always an encourager of breaking down parts of your life because I think that personal development can feel overwhelming at times, especially when that self-awareness comes in and then you look around and like the lights could just come on and you're like, oh shit, there's a lot to yeah. do here. And, yeah. and I always tell people, you know, practice self-compassion in those moments. We've all been in that place. If you, if you play personal development long enough, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. going to happen. There's such a deep connection. I think about the self-development industry and the worthiness wound. And the connection that I see is that while the self-development industry wants, quote unquote, like the, the um, overarching message of the self-development industry is that it wants people to feel confident, wants people to feel self-actualizing, it wants people to be enlightened, et cetera, et cetera. That's the narrative that the self-development industry says. You know, anyone can do it. You know, if you just work hard enough. Just try hard like, enough. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But what's, what people don't recognize in order for the self-development industry to exist, it has to feed off of your worthiness wound. So in order for the books to sell, the programs to sell, et cetera, et cetera, I mean, in many, many ways, the marketing is you're broken. I have the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, you're sorry, like this has sucked and this is really bad, but guess what? I have the answer and let me show you the way. Yeah. Um, and then it becomes like a form of gaslighting. It becomes very confusing for us because like, well, wait a minute. Like we want to heal this place within us, but it seems like the more search we do, the more broken we feel. Mm -hmm. How does that work? And that's why a lot of what I do and the, the perspective that I emphasize is there's nothing broken. And the worthiness wound, the existence of the worthiness wound is not an indication that there's something broken. I so feel like it just means that we're human. A hundred percent. Exactly. It means that we're human. It means that we're having a human experience. It means that there's an invitation here. Yeah. Always look at a wounding as an invitation. Mm -hmm. Instead of seeing it as, oh my God, there's this thing. I got to fix it. I got to find all the ways that I can like, you know, run away from it is what we're essentially saying. The opportunity is, can we look at this wounding as an invitation to deepen into ourselves. Yes. I love that last part. Well, and I don't know if you have experienced this as well, but you know, I've been doing this for, let's see, I started your kick-ass life in 2010. So it's been a minute and I pretty quickly, I, was, I would say at least the third year realized the moral dilemma of what you were just talking about, because mm -hmm. I found that there were certain people not not all of them by any stretch, but there were certain people that wanted to, you know, participate in my programs or hire me one-on-one. -on -one and they, maybe some of them even said it out loud. They wanted me to fix them. And I had to be very clear, like, this is not what this is. I, I can't, I'm not magic. Um, I don't have any mind control and it really, this is a lifelong process. You know, like, like the marketing experts don't want us to tell people that, <laughs> <laughs> they want to say like, no, I have the answer and this is it. And you're going to be fixed and cured at the end of this. And what I've had to tell people, especially when I have calls with people who are going to come to a retreat or do something that that's, that's higher end, because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, it's, you know, it's a lot of like one-on-one -on -one participation with me is that I am not the boss of you. Like I can't magically fix you. And it really is within yourself. And that this is just one of the steps of many that you will take in your personal development journey that is going to get you closer to yourself. What do you think about that? A hundred percent. Yeah. I love that. And I say that like, whenever we come with the energy of, I want you to fix me, you know, I am always very tender in that space. Very tender I've been, with I've been a student in that place. So I know what that's like, yeah. that desperate place. Mm -hmm. I have too. Yeah. We're so desperate. And I think that that is so divine because that desperation is actually coming from a deeper longing. And that longing is the highest space within us craving for us to move forward away from the pain that we have felt for so long to be the only option for us. So I love that craving. I love that longing. And yes, it leads into desperation. That's where we need to attune and we need to take a step back and we need to breathe and recognize that no one is going to save us. But at the same time, it's so beautiful that we have that, that longing. We have that craving. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's just, we do want to recognize that, you know, the reason why I think so many of us want somebody else to save us 
is because we're terrified of taking responsibility for our lives. And when I talk about taking responsibility, I'm always amazed at how skewed this conversation is because for many of us, particularly um, women, we're taught to take responsibility of things that aren't ours to take responsibility for, like the emotions of others and how mm-hmm. other people react and and. The um, because we're so emotionally attuned, we take that on as our as our own stuff. And then there's so many areas of our lives where we don't take responsibility, and we really hope that somebody else can save us. And so, developing a new relationship with this concept of taking self responsibility is such a beautiful um, opportunity for us to um, really recognize where there are places where we just don't want to take ownership of our lives, and that's really okay. Um, it's okay to be there. It's just, then you got to ask yourself, well, if I don't want to take responsibility and I don't, you know, and I want change, that's a real catch 22 here. What am I willing to do about it? Mm -hmm. I see it. I see that happen sometimes with, especially with women who have had really difficult romantic relationships. And cause mm-hmm. I'm like, raise my hand over here. Cause this was me. This was me too. I went from relationship to relationship, look, you know, putting all of my worthiness in my partner. And if, you know, if mm-hmm. he just, if he just treated me a certain way and loved me the way that I really, really wanted to be loved, then I would feel worthy. And this wasn't at that time. It wasn't conscious. It was, I just wanted, I just felt like I'd be happier. We would all be happier. Yeah. If he just behaved yeah. like I wanted him to. And then as soon as I came out of that and kind of saw the light and picked my head up out of the dirt, then I was looking for the next quote unquote answer. So personally, it wasn't until I was like, Oh, you mean this is all on me. And I, you're right. You used the word like terrified. Like I was terrified because I didn't know how mm-hmm. to trust myself. I didn't know like there was this whole concept of like self-love. I'm like, what does that even look like? I had to start from mm-hmm. the beginning. And I, I, I have such a soft place in my heart for women in that place, because like you said, it is, it's a beautiful place to be when you'd pick your head up and realize that when, when the shift for me happened, like, Oh wait, this is actually really powerful that I have the opportunity to do this. That I felt like was, you know, explosions happening. A hundred percent. I love that. Yeah. Well, I'm curious too, because you, you talk about, when you talk about healing worthiness, you talk about healing the little girl within. So Mm -hmm. what do you, what do you see a lot with your clients with doing, do you call it inner child work or or what do you, what do you do? What do you think? Yeah, I call it inner child work. You know, this is, um, a tool that my, um, healer taught me when I was, um, recovering from, um, disordered eating and I, it revolutionized my life. You know, this concept that there's so there's multiple parts of us and there is a part within all of us that is frozen in time, frozen in time at a time when we didn't know what to do. We didn't have any, um, skills for navigating what was going on in our lives. And so, um, that part of our psyche is still at that age, And more times than not, whenever we're having strong emotional reactions, whenever we're um, responding um, from a very wounded place and we feel collapsed, we feel um, incapable of like really being in our logic and we're just spiraling. Typically, that's the reaction of our little girl. Um, And so it's a great opportunity for us to give space for her and develop a relationship with her. And what happens when we do that is we actually right have more autonomy in our lives. We feel like we have more um, ability to respond versus reacting. Yes. I, I get curious in those moments because again, I still have those moments. <laughs> I get triggered. Yeah, we all do. Yeah. Yeah. It's an opportunity. It's, it's, you know, like there's that term AFCO, another fucking growth opportunity. <laughs> and I, I look at those moments as that I mean, I'm not particularly happy about him, but I think that I think all of us have them, no matter how long you've been doing this work, you're still going to have those moments where you don't think logically you react, you might get passive aggressive, you might get angry, you might rage, just not act like your best self. And I, just I think it's adorable <laughs> that like, we think that by doing the self-development work that somehow will become less human. <laughs> I, I, like that, just because wah, wah. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> this like spiritual work for 10 years that like, I won't ever be sad. Right. Or that uh-huh. I won't ever like have a reactive moment. Um, it's, a, that's an illusion that that's not in any way, shape or form based out of fa- uh, reality. It's a fantasy. It's a fantasy that we have because we don't know how to deal with our humanness. Yeah. And 
that I don't blame us. Like we don't know how to deal with our humanness because we live in a, an emotionally illiterate society that um, perpetuates our wounding and keeps us in a spiral of being busy and being productive. And listen, we weren't taught the right tools. We weren't. Mm -hmm. However, we get to now teach ourselves these tools and the tools doesn't take away our humanness. It teaches us how to navigate them with a little bit more grace. My work, the work that I do with my clients, the work that I do for myself, it's all about expanding my container of being with the fullness of my expression. It's not about denying my sadness or, or, Oh, if I meditate enough, then I'll never feel sad. Or, Oh, if I positive think myself enough, then no, nothing bad will ever happen to me. That's a fantasy. Yeah. And it's not, re it's not, healthy. We want to experience the full spectrum of the human experience. It's not about limiting that experience. It's about being able to hold it without collapsing. It's about being able to be stronger, resilient, more capable of navigating all of these things without it meaning something detrimental, bad, horrendous about who we are. Yeah. That's the real work. And so it's adorable when like I, I talk to people and they, you know, say, well, you know, I've been doing this work for a bajillion years, but like, you know, I still got sad over that. And it's like, fuck, of course you still got sad over that. You're right? human. Mm -hmm. That's what we're here to do is to experience all of these emotions. Um, it's just how do we experience them so that they in Form us instead of dictate our lives. And that's a huge difference. Yes. They inform us instead of dictating our lives. So it's instead, and that, this is what I tell my clients all the time when they, when I can tell that they've like either put me up on a pedestal or just like assume that I, cause I remember for years and years and years, I saw the same therapist and there came a day mm. where I felt so defeated and I had made up a story that her life was perfect. And I looked at her and I said, and I know this is like not part of the therapy therapy model, but, and this was bad. This was a long time ago when I think even less therapists were, were ever expressing their own stuff. And I looked at her and I said, can you please just tell me one hard thing that's happened in your marriage? Cause I'm making up that you have a perfect marriage. And she started laughing and she told me something. But I trust people more when they are kind of like a candy cane, when it's like the dark and light, mm -hmm. I can see both. And mm -hmm. it's exactly, and I tell my clients this all the time, like the difference between me now than the, than the me 12 years ago when I first started doing this work is that I can navigate this with resilience and a little bit more grace. And, and trust me, there are times when I am not my best self, when I've been passive aggressive with my husband, when I've snapped at somebody and I have to turn around and go clean it up with my tail between my legs a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not my mm -hmm. favorite moments, but it is, it's just about not letting those feelings and triggers and, um, and old patterns dictate your thoughts, your decisions, your behaviors for longer than it needs to. A hundred percent. I hope yes. you do spoken word poetry because I love listening to you preach. You have such a great <laughs> way. Of, I just think you're how expressive you are. is just beautiful. I just wanted to acknowledge that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, speaking of preaching you, I know you speak a lot about very important social justice issues. And you said, before we started recording, you said you can't talk about the worthiness wound without talking about whiteness. So can you tell us about what you mean by that? Yeah, you know, when we look at what contributes to the worthiness wound, um, one of the many contributors is our culture, right? Yeah. I mean, um, as women, we get to really be viscerally aware of how we were not taught the same skills. We were not treated in the same way as men. And therefore, it is very clear how men have less of this sense of unworthiness than we do. And of course I'm gen I'm stereotyping. Yeah. I'm painting broad brush. Generalizing. Terms, generalizing. That's the word. Yes. Um, but then the more marginalized of an identity we carry, the greater the um, pressure from our culture to have a worthiness wound because our culture tells us that if you look a certain way and act a certain way, um, if we, you are this perfect idealized woman, um, then you will be protected. You will be safe. You will be happy. And as, as you deviate from that norm, the more you're inherently punished for not being what you should be according to our culture. And so one of the way, one of the many, um, systems that perpetuate our worthiness wound is whiteness as well as cis heteronormativity, mm -hmm. um, as well as patriarchy. And so our, um, white supremacy culture tells us that beauty is through the lens of whiteness and that if you are white and if you, um, perpetuate the narrative of whiteness, then you will be okay. 
And if you're not, the more you deviate from that lens of whiteness, the more you're shunned, the more you're not okay, the more you're broken, the more you need to fix yourself, the more you need to experience a sense of unworthiness as a, as a shame mechanism to get you back to normal. You know what I mean? Like normal as our culture defines it. So, you know, we have to be looking at these systems if we're to really address the worthiness round. And whiteness, white supremacy is embedded in every single system in our culture. And so part of the work of doing our own internalized healing is also recognizing how our behavior, our actions, our experience, our um, embodiment is impacting and affecting other people. And that includes as a white woman, how my whiteness is perpetuating white supremacy. How did you, I know Desiree Attaway loves to ask the question, like what radicalized you? What, what made you come to all of these, these realizations in your, in your own personal Mm. life? Yeah. You know, so, you know, I'm not unlike many other white women who kind of woke up when Trump was elected. Um, but that wasn't the only thing that was going on. I think it was just all coincided. It was like one big, um, just, all these different forces coming together. I, I think is the word you're yeah. looking for <laughs> with this topic. Yeah, there's a lot of things coming together. I was doing some deeper healing around my mother wound and around uh, my relationship with my mother that was allowing me to kind of step more and more into my own power. I was getting very jaded with the coaching industry, and mm-hmm. I talk a lot about that on my podcast. I mean, I just felt so frustrated by an industry that perpetuates this lifestyle marketing as the answer to all of your problems. Like, look at me, look how beautiful and amazing I am. I live such a beautiful life. Look at my private jet and make millions of dollars. So obviously you can't too, cause I'm just a small girl from a small town, from a small bump box. So like, if I'm this way, you can be this way too. And I was, I was participating in that a hundred percent in lifestyle marketing and um, this idea of putting myself on this pedestal and it wasn't working for me. I was feeling incongruent and I was feeling frustrated in this industry that continues to objectify women in this way. And, um, I joined a Facebook group that's un- in no longer in existence, but I joined this Facebook group where there was a lot of conversations on social justice and I wasn't aware of anything social justice. I didn't know what that really meant. And Um, There were a lot of conversations in that group about um, whiteness and white supremacy and white people are inherently racist um, just because of the color of their skin and that we have work to do to unpack our whiteness. And of course, like most white people wakening up to their whiteness, there was a lot of who me like that's not me. Like, I don't do that. I don't participate in that way. Look at what a good white person I am. Exactly. Um, I'm an Mm -hmm. immigrant also. I'm from Brazil. So like there was also that like I'm not American. Like, this isn't my shit. Like, I don't need to own this. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, the more I participated in that group and then Trump got elected and I was feeling really uh, embodied and empowered in a different way in my personal life, it all just came together for me to just have that awakening of, Oh, holy shit. I, I'm white, you know, Mm -hmm. that means something. And that means something in our culture. Um, and so I, was disgusted at my business and, um, not from a judgmental space. Cause I didn't know any better quote unquote, but from a, a genuine, like, Oh my gosh, like I, I'm talking about the empowerment of women. I believe in the empowerment of all women, but really, if you go to my business, if you hear what I'm talking about, I'm really only empowering white women, people that look like and, me. Mm-hmm. people that look like me and have my same lived experience. And like, I don't want that does not that did not sit right with me. I did not want to be that person. Um, and so I completely dismantled my business and built it back up. I joke that I built it back up brick by brick. Obviously I don't have a brick and mortar business, but, um, built my business back up and questioning myself every step of the way. Like, how can I make sure that my business is inclusive, but not just as a performative allyship sort of way. It's like, Hey, look at me. I'm inclusive. But from a, like a genuine, like, how can I make sure that my work embodies the full spectrum of the human experience? Um, and it took a lot of work as you know, anyone does when they're undoing their lens. And, um, but it also gave me such a tremendous amount of depth of understanding the worthiness wound at a different level. Um, because I really started to recognize and understand just how much culture plays a role in our worthiness wound. Because, you know, for uh, white people, because we don't see our race, our race is the normal race, so we don't see our race, 
it's very hard for us to recognize where culture um, perpetuates our worthiness. Um, more so if you are, let's say, a white man, you know, it's even mm-hmm. harder for you to see systems of oppression and how those oppressive systems dictate our worth. Um, and so it's important for us to be recognizing, regardless of our race and gender, we have to be seeing how our society perpetuates worthiness through not only within ourselves, but within other people, if we are to do radical healing. Yeah. Oh, there's so many things I want to underscore in what you just said. And I so appreciate you sharing your experience. I didn't, I didn't know. I'm always, I'm always curious about, you know, what radicalized people. And I thought yeah. I had made up that you've been doing this work for way, way longer that it had been like, you know, from the mm-hmm. beginning of time. Cause I know you and I have only known each other for, I don't know, maybe over a year or so. Yeah. Uh, and I just, I also feel like, and I know that there's a handful of coaches that listen to this podcast. And I really feel like if you are in the wellness industry, whether you're in fitness, health and fitness, or personal development, I feel like you cannot ignore this. And and it's just one of those things where I had um, Andrea Renee Johnson on here and she wrote a really, really great blog post. And I'm going to link to it in the show notes where she talks about what you were briefly saying about how if you're someone who, you know, teaches, preaches, educates, whatever on women's empowerment, you have got to take a step back and look at the big picture and look at everything from your the copy on your website to your stock photos to the emails that you send out to your social media posts and and are you I and mean, this isn't to blame and shame anybody. This is just like this is, you know, part of doing the work. It's it like look, are you ha- having a very narrow lens on like, like we just said, you know, oh, wait, this is great, but pretty much only for people that, that look like me. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm in a class right now and uh, called Foundations of Social Justice. And I, I haven't talked about it all on the podcast for a couple of reasons. A, I'm not done with it. And I, I want to make sure that I've absorbed everything so I can talk about it eloquently. I'm going to have the teacher on as a guest too, but also because holy shit, like this class is, I had to write my teacher an email because I, it's interesting. A couple of things have happened in this class. I have come to the realization that I have some work to do and I'm in the work right now of healing from my own many things, (laughs) many, many things, but more specifically as it pertains to this conversation, the rage that I have around rape culture in general and Mm. my own so much sexual harassment and some sexual assaults and just so much sexual harassment throughout my life. And granted it's, it's slowed down a lot since I've reached middle age now, it's not as much, but it's, um, I was noticing in my comments in the class that I was just really cynical and like the, I, and my teacher pointed it out. And I said, you know what? I appreciate that you pointed out my cynicism because this, this comes from a very wounded place and I'm not just angry. I have a lot of rage around it. And so Mm -hmm. I'm working on that, but it's interesting to be in a class and learning about these topics when I am both the oppressed and the oppressor. Mm -hmm. And it's really complicated. That's the only word I can think of right now. It's, it's complicated emotions and feelings and it's heavy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually I talk about this a lot in my work. Um, but in this scope, um, a little bit, cause I think it's really important is holding the both. And, Mm -hmm. um, the both and is to be able to hold to what seems to be juxtapositioning, um, concepts, ideas, feelings, and be able to hold both as part of our human experience. Um, and so that looks like, you know, when someone dies and we feel both the grief and the relief, and then we feel guilt because we're not supposed to feel the relief. We're supposed to only feel, um, the sadness of the death. And, um, it's like, well, what if you can hold both? What if both are allowed to be here? What would that look like? You know, what would you have to feel if you gave yourself permission to allow both to exist? And for most of us, what we would have to feel is that we're human. And again, we live in this fantasy of believing that if we can pull ourselves into this fantasy that we're not human, we never have to feel hurt again. And it doesn't work that way. It's a false shield that doesn't allow us to then have the right tools to navigate this stuff, right? Like if we're perpetuating this idea of positive thinking, positive thinking, positive thinking, we don't learn the tools of how to navigate things when shit hits the fan, Mm -hmm. right? So like... In this particular case, holding the possibility that we're both the oppressor and the oppressed 
is so important because then we can use our understanding of where we are oppressed to have greater compassion and understanding and awareness for where we oppress. Yeah. Um, and I just want to remind all of us that there are so many areas of our lives for us to be exploring like ableism and fat mm-hmm. phobia. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are places that I don't think get enough attention particularly in the wellness community, um, that, you know, there's this, um, concept of health at every size. And yet it's hard for so many people to reconcile with the fact that, you know, people don't owe us their health, no. you know, and we do not need to demand that anybody looks a certain way. And wherever we do, wherever we're perpetuating this idea of being skinny, of losing weight, of being, you know, uh, measuring your worth down to what's on the scale of what's your pant size, even if it's under the guise of empowerment, what we're doing is we're perpetuating fat phobic culture. We're yeah. perpetuating ableism. And we need to be careful with that because it's not, it's dehumanizing. It's dehumanizing to large swaths of people. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's an important conversation, but there are so many intersections where we also have an opportunity to do exploration of the both and of holding the space that we are both the oppressor and the oppressed. And because you are the oppressor does not mean that you are a bad person. Yeah. And wherever there is that space, it's because there's a worthiness wound that play. And again, this is why I believe healing the worthiness wound is a radical act. Because when we can heal or um, step into greater awareness of our worthiness wound, then we can hold greater space for where we are the oppressor mm-hmm. without making it us. Because when we make something mean about us, we're no longer naming the harm and putting the attention to where it matters. Yeah. That's right? so, so important. Like, we need to be tuning into that and doing the work of healing the worthiness wound. I've seen to be a great way. It's not the only way. I'm not this only person. It's There's so many ways to this, but I found it to be such a great way to ease into this understanding that just because that we are oppressing does not mean we now get to spiral in shame and guilt, put our head back in the sand and check out from this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. To me, I call that like having stamina. I just, Mm. I, and it didn't, and I, I wonder for me personally, because I've talked about challenging, you know, and heavy topics for such a long time, I, you know, hear people's shame stories on the regular and I can hold that space for them. And I've, I've delved into my own many, many years. I got, I feel like I, I made it through that, that very first part of, you know, finding out, oh, that I actually am a racist. Oh, that I am the oppressor. Oh, that I have all these, you know, fat phobic and just, and on and on and on. And I moved through that fairly quickly, just in terms of like that shame and that, that wound so that I can now have Mm -hmm. the conversation and people can point out things that I've done that are racist or fat phobic or whatever it is. And I can take that in and know that I'm not a terrible person for having done that, that I'm, I'm an American who grew up in this shitty culture (laughs) and, Mm -hmm. and learn from it. But I, I, I just, I say that because I, I encourage people to step into the work that if you are doing this work or even just hearing this conversation between me and Thais and feeling like, Ooh, that wash of shame, that's okay. Like keep walking forward. It will pass. What you need Mm -hmm. is the stamina to be able to have the conversations for longer periods of time with people and not like, just like you just said so beautifully, not make it about you. It's not about you. It's about the system. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And this is this is where I get excited is when I see teachers use what has been traditionally tools to perpetuate white supremacy in the self-development industry, using those tools to actually help us navigate the complexity of the human experience. This is where I get really excited because this is the way forward. I believe this is how we change systems in our industry, right? In this specific space, this tools of both. And, you know, this is in many ways, a similar concept to love and light, which is to love all, to accept all, to embrace all. But oftentimes We use the concept of love and light to spiritually bypass the shadow. Um, And it doesn't have to be that way. It does not have to be that way. We can use these tools. It's just a tool is a tool. It's like a hammer. We get to decide how to use it. 
and we get to use it in ways that will rat, that will like completely turn whiteness on its head. Um, but we can't really be having a conversation on whiteness without also broaching the topic of power, right? Because whiteness is all about power. And so recognizing power dynamics and recognizing where we're committed and ready and willing to put our power space down for other people is essential, you know, or else it all becomes talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's oh, it's such a, a I need to have you on so we can just talk about this because there's so many different avenues that 100%. we can go down yeah. that we can go down and well, and I'm I'm curious what your take is on this because and this is something gonna because I, I hear different opinions from different people. And what is your take on I've heard around town, and what I mean by that is, you know, on social media, which is I know not the answer <laughs> to everything, is that mm-hmm. two white women should not be having this conversation. And my mm-hmm. argument is always, well, I am a white woman who my my audience is prime I, I don't know. I would say a good portion of them are white and they're interested in being better humans. And a lot of my guests, like yourself, are are white and they're also doing this work. And so I'm curious what your take is on that. Yeah. You know, it's a good question. Something that I've navigated as well. I have my podcast reclaim and um, my dear friend, Lindsay Ray and I have a series on the podcast called you're waking up to your white privilege. Now what? So it's like a five part series. um, talking about whiteness. And when we were putting together the episodes and thinking about how we wanted to go about doing this, we asked ourselves, you know, is it appropriate? Is it appropriate for these two white women to be talking about race? But here's the thing that I've set, settled with and um, feels really right for me is that, like, listen, I'm not an anti-racism educator. Mm-hmm. I do not position myself as an anti-racism educator. I amplify the fuck out of so many incredible women of color who are doing this work and they need to be amplified. And they need to be compensated for their work. And it's also very valuable as a white woman for me to be sharing my experiences around waking up to my whiteness. Because for many of us, as we navigate life, it's helpful to hear from other people who are similar to us, be going through an experience and sharing that experience and learning from that experience. Yeah. This can be, this can be thought in every single which way. If I'm navigating a broken leg, it's really helpful for me to see other people who have gone through this experience to show me the way. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is important that as white people, we're having this conversation because we need to be talking about whiteness in our communities, not just whenever there's a person of color in the room or whenever the subject is on race. Something that I've noticed that I've become very conscious of on my podcast is How often do I talk about race with my guests who are white versus how often do I talk about race with my guests who are non-white, right? Who are women of color. Mm -hmm. Do I expect my women of color guests to always talk about race? Do their lives have to be like their expertise? Does it have to be talking about race? Yes. No. Right. And then, then why are, am uh, And then am I expecting my white guests to not be defined by race and not have to talk about race because that's not a part of their lived experience, right? So it's I've had to sit with that and really look at how am I making sure that my conversations on race is founded on a deep understanding that just because as white people, we don't often feel like we have a race, race is just as much of a part of our experience as somebody else. And because we don't see our race, we then don't see other people's race. So then we perpetuate a system that oppresses and hurts and harms and abuses people of color while we get to sit here and be like, I don't see color. I'm a non-race racialized person. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's beautifully said, and it sounds like it's another one of another instance where it's the both and. Like you can, because I don't know how comfortable I would feel if some white dude had a podcast and he was talking about sexism and like dismantling the patriarchy with like other white dudes on his podcast and like never checked in with any women. I'd be like, mm. <laughs> you mm-hmm. might want to at least check in with some women <laughs> every mm-hmm. once in a while and ask them if they want to come on and talk about it. And it's not up to them, but if they're willing, then yeah. So I think I, I think it's uh, it's beautifully said. And I agree with what you said. And yes, thank you. There's a, 
beautiful resource that I highly recommend. It's called Seen on Radio. Um, and they're a podcast that does that have done two series, right, so far that I'm in love with. The first series that they did was Seeing White. Um, and it's, I don't know how many episodes there are, maybe 10 episodes on the history of whiteness in the United States. Oh, wow. And it's created by a white guy. Um, and it's his exploration of his whiteness and the history of whiteness in this country. And he has and brought on um, a black man to support him in that conversation. And the black man checks him and questions him. And, you know, like it's, it's, a, it's beautiful. So now he's doing another series um, called Men. And it's all about patriarchy in our society. Ooh, I need to and listen to that he, my husband. Oh, it's so good. And he brought on a woman of color to check him and to help him understand where he's not seeing things. Mm -hmm. But I like that he's doing this work because I don't want to be doing that work of (laughs) educating men on patriarchy. I think it's important that he's doing that work, but that he is, like you said, checking in with somebody who can show him where he's biased, who can show him where he is unconsciously upholding the system. And it's the same thing for all of us. It's like, we should not rely on the people of color in our lives to educate us, to be informing us constantly of where we're gone wrong. We have to support each other as white people. We have to be comfortable calling each other white as white people because we should not put that in labor onto people of color. At the same time, it's so important that we have people of color on to have these conversations because, you know, it's their experience. Mm -hmm. Just like what you said, I would want to make sure that any podcast that's about patriarchy is including women because this is our experience. Yeah. Um, and so we do have to be conscious of this and it's, it's, it's complicated. It's not an easy answer. Everyone has to find their own line and what that looks like for them. Um, but we do need to be having these conversations in our white spaces because the majority of spaces are white and that's where we need to be. You know, we need to be there talking Mm -hmm. about this stuff. This is how we're calling people in. This is how we're changing the, the individuals in our lives, you know, and like as white people, we need to be having these conversations with our families, with our friends. We need to be calling out microaggression that's happening. Racist jokes. Oh my gosh. I found the other day a meme and it was like the most amazing response to a racist joke. So like if somebody, you know, in your family, in your friend puts out a racist, any type of joke that's Mm -hmm. inappropriate, right? Just say, I don't get it. <laughs> and then, you know, have like, oh a hot affect, like, I don't get it. And then watch them scramble, trying to justify and explain their racist attitude. Oh, and that's just, awkward. I don't, get it. I don't get it. And like, What's funny it's about so that? Weird. So poignant because, you know, eventually you can say, I don't think that that's cool, dude. Right? Like, that's not appropriate. Like, we should, this is not something to be joking about. However way you want to check with that person. But, um... We need to be having these conversations with amongst ourselves Mm -hmm. is what I'm. Yes. I've, I've had them with people in my um, regular life and it is interesting. (laughs) It's interesting and it's not easy, but it's absolutely a thousand percent necessary. And again, it's, it's building up the stamina to be able to sit with that discomfort when you say, I don't get it. And look at that person yeah. in the face with, you know, with a straight face. And all it is, is stamina. And I know that you all can do it that are listening. Thais, thank you so much for your time today. I have so loved this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Can I just leave one more final thought? Absolutely. The greatest thing that we can do for ourselves, whether it's tackling on um, the worthiness wound, whether it's anything in the self-development, whether it's um, you know, dismantling whiteness, patriarchy, white, cis, heteronormative, blah, blah, you know, all of the ism is our ability to sit with the discomfort. So I love that you said that because that is so critical. The more we can sit with our own discomfort, the more we can change things. And believe it or not, we can sit with uncomfortable experiences like shame and guilt. They're not going to break us. No. We get to do this work. We get to expand our capacity to be with what is uncomfortable, what arises within us. And wherever you need to get support to expand your capacity to be with these uncomfortable things, do it. Because that is what's going to allow us to truly rise up together and come together in a big, beautiful, different way than what we're seeing in our culture. Yeah. 
That's it. Oh, now I'm thank done. You. Okay. And <laughs> scene. No, I love that. And, and also I'm going to throw in one more link in the show notes, everybody. There is a Facebook forum called The Start and it is, I believe it's hosted by Rachel Cargill and she may have handed it off to somebody, but it, it is specifically for white women who are just starting out in this conversation and they don't know how to respond to things or, or start a conversation with someone. And so it's a place where you can go to ask those, you know, quote unquote, dumb questions that you're afraid to ask and you can ask them there. So I'm going to post that link in the show notes and Thais, tell everyone where they need to go so they can read all your blog posts and, and follow you on social media, et cetera. Yeah, you can go to my website, taysky.com. You know, that's where you can find all the things. Um, and I'm predominantly on Instagram and you can find me there at, um, at I am Thais Sky. And of course, those links will be in the show notes. I highly encourage you all to, I love, I love your writing. I love your Instagram posts and how open you are and honest. And I, I love following you and I think everyone should go and follow you. And to all the listeners out there today, thank you so much for being here with us. I am so grateful for your time. I know how valuable it is. And I do not take that for granted that you come to spend it with me and my guests here on the show. And until next time, everyone, I will see you all out in cyberspace. Bye everybody.